I started this as a project for Columbia Journalism School seven years ago, eight years ago almost, uh, because I was fascinated, well, mostly because I was desperate because I need something to write about, but also I've always been fascinated by fringe cultures, uh, ideas outside the mainstream, people sort of on the edge somehow. And so when I heard rumors that there were Nazis in Greenpoint, uh, which is a neighborhood of Brooklyn close to my house, I thought that's very bizarre in almost like a vice, like just, you know, how, how strange is this kind of thing? So I started to look into it and they'd been gentrified out a long time ago. But I quickly find out, find out there's another group operating in the Brooklyn area called the National Socialist Movement. And I started Googling them. I went on all the forums, all the websites, and I emailed pretty much every single email address I could find and I didn't hear anything back. And I thought, okay, I'll, I'll find something else. But then two months later, I got an email back from a guy who introduced himself as Duke Schneider, um, captain of the SS in, in Brooklyn. And I thought, what a, what a strange way to introduce yourself uh, in an email. But I emailed him back, and he was indeed the captain of the SS in Brooklyn, such as it was. Um, and we met for coffee, and we talked, and we kept meeting for coffee a few times, and I explained who I was and what I was looking into. I wanted to find out why anyone would subscribe to this ideology. Why would anyone choose to march under arguably the most hated symbol in recent history? Why would anyone want to shoulder the considerable social costs of being an out-and-out -out Nazi? And, you know, last but not least, why would anyone believe this this rhetoric and this ideology. So he would always, he, on the far right, people are very paranoid because they always believe they're being chased by the government and by anti-racists and by the CIA and all kinds of things. So he would always insist that we met somewhere far, far out in Brooklyn, uh, which is a place called the Avenue U Station. It's very, very far out. It's alphabetical, so you can imagine how far out Avenue U is. Um, and I would take the train there, and he would be, there's a, there was, an, there was an overpass where the train went, and he would always be under the overpass in the shadows. And Duke is a very short, very round man. Um, and he always wore, he always wore a, a trench coat, uh, which looks strange when you're a s spherical person. Uh, but he, he, had, he had it tied around his waist very tightly, and we would get into his Hyundai, and we would crisscross the neighborhood a bunch of times because he felt he was being chased by all kinds of people. But we would always end up 200 yards down the street at this diner called El Greco Diner, and there he would sit and explain to me what he believed, uh, why he was doing what he was doing. And eventually I was invited to um, their yearly convention, the National Socialist Movement's convention, which turned into uh, an article, uh, and it's actually, it appears in, in this book too. After that, I was done. I thought, okay, I, I wrote my article. I was pretty happy about it. I didn't feel like really like I understood what they were about, but you know, I was ready to move on. And so I w moved back to Norway, which was the summer where Anders Bering Breivik, a far-right nationalist, decided to go ahead and, and murder 77 of our best and brightest kids at a, at a, at a camp for, for um, the, the Labour Party's youth. And this was something that completely took Norway uh, by surprise. We, we never in a million years had we thought this was possible. And it really opened our eyes to the far right and their rhetoric. And I began thinking about how dangerous this ideology is if, if left alone. Um, how, in a way, we didn't understand enough about it and I wanted to look further into it. So when I moved back to America, I decided to use the sources I developed for the first article to find out more. I wanted to find out why people still believed in this. And I wanted to find out why people joined these kinds of groups. So I kind of jumped into a, a rabbit hole of, of hate and bigotry and stayed there for a long time. Um, I mean, I was always open with who I was. I'm a Norwegian socialist and I'm ideologi ideologically their enemy, I suppose. but. I kept going back to these people and I spent the better part of seven years and, and I only kind of recently emerged with, with this book in hand. And I don't know how many questions it, it answers, hopefully a few, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read a little bit to you. Um, I'm going to read from 
on election night um, of 2016, I was in the trailer of Matthew Heimbach. Matthew is the leader of the Traditionalist Workers' Party, which is a large national socialist neo-Nazi uh, organization in America. He's a, he's a fascist, he's a national socialist, he's a Russian Orthodox, um, and he's become a relatively important leader on the far right, and he became the main person of this book, so I was at his house on, on election night. So I'll start reading a little bit, and we'll see how it goes. <clears throat> By nine o'clock, I was miserably watching the apotheosis of white fear and anger in America. And my worry had shifted from Hillary losing, which was by then an almost certainty, to whether there was enough beer on hand to drown out the gloating from Matthew and his friend Miles. We were on a threadbare sofa in one of the two trailers that made up his home and the headquarters for his political party, the Traditionalist Workers' Party. His buddy Miles was leaning against the wall, furiously vaping. Another party member, Jason, was sitting on the floor, and Matthew Parrott, Matthew's friend and father-in-law, was walking in and out, endlessly checking the odds on the betting sites. Matthew was standing up more often than he was sitting down, shouting at the TV, jeering if Hillary was on the screen, cheering if Trump was, and intermittently reminding Gary Johnson, who was siphoning votes from Trump in Florida, to go f*** himself. Hillary needed Pennsylvania and North Carolina to win, but they were looking shaky. If they went to Trump, the game was over. The consensus in the trailer was that the Democrat shilling traders at CNN were too deep in their Jewish taskmaster's pocket to call the election for Donald Trump. It didn't surprise them. They expected very little from the media. But it was still annoying as hell. God damn it, just fucking call it, Matthew shouted. He blew an angry puff of vapor from pursed lips, repeating it a couple of times impatiently huffing on the conical mouthpiece of his vape. The plume expanded under the low ceiling, enveloping him and clouding Wolf Blitzer's face on the screen. A sweet, sweaty smell filled the trailer. Pizza boxes littered the floor. Empty beer bottles crowded the underside of the sofa, spilling their remaining drops of dead beer on the thick carpet. Then, Trump took North Carolina. And it looked like the election might be over. Fucking Trump! Matthew shouted to Parrot, who just then came back into the room. F***ing Trump is going to win this for us. Parrot had his laptop in his hands and was refreshing a website every few seconds, watching the odds slowly tilt in Trump's favor. Still too early to say, he cautioned. But it's not looking bad. He refreshed the website again. Not bad at all. F*** you, it's not looking bad, Matthew said. We got this. Hillary is f***ing done. Matthew didn't normally swear, but he seemed to have made an allowance for tonight. He smacked me hard on the back. You liberal pieces of shit are going down, he said. And Miles asked me if I was going to cry. Wolf Blitzer came on the screen again, saying that although it was still too early to call Florida, the Trump campaign must be feeling good right now. You're fucking cowards, Matthew screamed at the screen. It's so clear they're working for Hillary. Not that he could blame them for dragging it out. Their world was collapsing. The elites, the media, the liberals. Every single traitor was about to wake up in a country where the white working man had finally struck back and taken power. Every swing state that tumbled into Donald Trump's column was a validation of what Matthew had been working for all this time. A nationalist in the White House. A wall on the Mexican border. No more Muslims coming in. And most importantly... White men and women in this country had a voice again. The whole thing disgusted me. Perhaps not so much Matthew's gloating, but the miserable idea that the majority of Americans might agree with Trump's politics was almost too much to bear. I'd watched the far right in America had gone from a bickering, dysfunctional group of racist malcontents to what it was now. Still bickering and dysfunctional, but, as far as they were concerned, about to put their guy in the White House. We were out of beer. Matthew was in my face shouting. Miles was jeering from behind a cloud of smoke. Jason's brother Zach loomed next to me at his desk, where he kept a gun that he sometimes pointed at imagined enemies on the wall. Wisconsin was still out, 
but I couldn't take it anymore and got up on unsteady legs. I needed fresh air, but more than that, I needed to get out of there. All the time I'd been reporting on the far right, my one big comfort had been that these people would probably never get to power, that their worldview would never be validated. But now, here we were, on the precipice of God knows what, but certainly nothing good. You're not going to watch us win? asked Matthew. I mumbled something about stealing his car as I grabbed the keys from the counter and stumbled into the dark. I drove at a snail's pace back to the hotel, trying to will my vision not to blur and the road to stop moving around. The, the TV was on in the lobby of the Best Western, but I covered my ears and closed my eyes as I rushed past, thinking for a second about Schrodinger's cat and how, at that moment, Hillary had both lost and won the election. I jumped into bed and fell into a black sleep. My phone woke me up at three in the morning with a text message from Matthew. Wisconsin goes to Trump. Everything you love will burn. LOL. Smiley face. The far right had their president, and all I had was a splitting hangover and five years worth of notes that I hoped would help me figure out how they'd managed to pull it off. So, um... The day after the election was a weird day for, I guess, for, for a lot of us. I don't know, maybe some of you guys celebrated, but for me it was, a, it, it was a strange day because we all talked about how it had happened and everyone was kind of baffled about it. And we seemed, at least in the days af right after, to land on this conclusion that it all came down to race, that it all, you know, America had voted along race lines, which I still think is, is largely true, but it presented the question that shouldn't I have seen this coming since I'd spent the better part of six years with these people who seem to have just won the election. Um, and, and maybe, I don't know, maybe I should have, but I, I kept thinking back to this moment I had in 2011. I was in a, in a backyard in, in New Jersey and it was raining and everything was soaking wet and this guy called... Um, Lieutenant Hickey, he's a lieutenant of the National Socialist Movement. For some reason, they insist on giving each other military ranks, even though they're a very small neo-Nazi group. Uh, it was his backyard, and he directed a bunch of gazebo tents. Um, and along the walls, he had banners with um, the swastika. And there was a little buffet, and there was a table of trinkets where you could buy stuff. And all around me, neo-Nazis were drinking and, and celebrating because it was their annual convention. And they, they directed this big wooden swastika in the yard in the rain and I remember Lieutenant Hickey complaining that he'd had to go buy extra kerosene otherwise it wouldn't burn but they finally got it going and um, as I was sitting in the gazebo watching all these neo-Nazis salute a, a, a burning swastika while horrified neighbors looked on in the windows I was talking to Jeff Scoop who was their leader at the time well he still is and and he told me that they wanted to start fielding candidates that they wanted to run for election and I said well, I mean, there's no way. I mean, your ideas just won't fly in America. He said that, you know, with the right candidate, um, then America was absolutely ready to hear what they had to say. America was ready for, for a nationalist candidate with, with, with nationalist ideas. And as I left that place, I remember thinking, you know, this guy, is, he's been huffing glue. There's just no way this will happen. And turns out he was right. You know, turns out they, 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 they saw this coming. So I tried for the longest time to figure out what these people wanted and who they were, and I still don't have a satisfactory answer, but I was able to, I don't know, bear witness in some way as a movement that was totally, completely, and absolutely in disarray, just filled with bickering and infighting, uh, managed to become the zeitgeist of the moment. And I don't think they all elected Donald Trump. I think there were other reasons involved, but they certainly had their finger on the pulse of that moment. Um, whether or not they've been able to capitalize it on it since is a, is a whole different matter. But I think, in a way, they understood America better than a lot of us did. And that's a pretty terrifying, um, terrifying idea. Oh, that was a text from Matthew. Um, when um, when Trump won the election, he texted me in the middle of the night saying, everything you love will burn, which is kind of a thinly veiled threat, I guess. I mean, I'm sure he meant it in a, in a jocular way. I'd known him for years at that time, but, you know, 
saying to a liberal that everything you love will burn certainly isn't necessarily nice. Um, I also believe that it goes a little bit to how these people see the world around them. The far right in America, especially the most extreme end of the spectrum, which is what I've been covering, believe that they're in an, in an existential struggle. And so I think that phrase describes their worldview as well. They do believe that everything they love will, will burn unless, unless they, they, they fight back. So it describes a little bit of their mindset, I think. Um, you know, whether or not it's going well at the moment is, is kind of up in the air, but yeah. Yes, please. How do they feel about the culture? Um, good and bad, mm -hmm. which is weird. Um, the, the main guy, Matthew Heimbach, um, said he likes it, which I really don't know how to feel about that. Um, you know, I set out to, he's an adult, so he knows that whatever he says and whatever he does when he's around me ends up in the book. So he recognizes that although he doesn't come across as the greatest guy, at least it was truthful, which I think is about as much as he could hope for. Um, I've had some of them say they're going to show up to readings. I don't think they're here. Uh, I think this is more in the South. But I think they're okay with it. I mean, I didn't set out to get anyone. I, I set out to describe a, a group of people, and I feel like I did. You know, this book isn't a discussion about the merits of Nazism. I feel like there's no discussion to be had there. It is a terrible, awful, horrendous, abhorrent, and a bunch of other adjective, uh, adjectives. Uh, so I didn't really sort of, I, I, I don't feel like it merits discussion. It is objectively bad. So I just wanted to, I wanted to cover the humans, the, the people, and that's how I tried to approach it. You mentioned the military ranks that they, they adopted. Yeah, is that weird? I, I wondered if, um, did any of them have military backgrounds, or that was that affectation, or? I think it's a little bit of both. I, th I You know, I met people who were veterans. Um, it's, I, I won't say it's a cross-section of society, but, but it's not, but people come to this from, from all walks of life. This, um, the stereotype that they're all sort of poor and, and, and stupid and, and broke is a little bit misleading and, you know, we, we subscribe to it at our peril. Not all of them are broke and stupid uh, from Appalachia, but they come from all different walks of life. Um, I think the military aspect of it is to give, give themselves a sense of value, a sense of purpose. And, you know, they believe in a way that they're fighting for their future which is of course nonsense. I mean, it's, I guess that's what they tell themselves in the morning to get out of bed, but, and you know, if they're warriors then they're more li liable to give themselves ranks as well. I mean, it's, it's utter, like if you're in the NSM, you will get promoted to general just by showing up to two meetings in a row. Uh, but you know, that's what they do. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, are, are you on a book tour, or will you be in New York? I have relatives there. I just did, yeah, I'm based in New York, so I just did two readings in, in New York. Um, I'll be back. Fair schedule that you have? Yeah, yeah, yeah. On, uh, if you just Google me, it should, it, should, uh, it should come up. But if they just buy me a cup of coffee, I'll show up to their, uh, their house and <laughs> talk. I don't have anything better to do. <laughs> so what is the real difference between nationalism and national socialism? <clears throat> so glad you asked, because I don't really know the answer, but I know there's an answer. Um, so in my book, I try, to, um, I try to explain the various different isms and all the, all the different distinctions. Have you guys all seen um, Life of Brian? You know when they talk to, about the people's Judean front and the Judean people's front uh, and the people, yeah. It's kind of like that. It's very, it doesn't really, the distinctions aren't big, but they're massive. In, within the movement. Um, so just to be clear, in this book, I try to differentiate. I mean, I sp if you're, you know, for, for the sake of argument, I'm quite happy for you guys all to call them white supremacists because, you know, at the very foundation, that's what it is. I only made, um, I differentiated because there are national socialists who subscribe to the politics of Adolf Hitler in the 30s, and I call them national socialists, neo-Nazis. Then there are those who just simply believe that we need to close the borders because the Mexicans are coming, and that's a very nationalistic worldview. Then there is the KKK who are out and out white supremacists because it's in their very nature that they believe the white race is better than any other races. 
So for me, it's just sort of for accuracy's sake. Um, it doesn't really make that much sense. You know, people call them the alt-right or the Nazis, and you know, we all get what they mean. But there are small differences uh, that I that I've tried to that I've tried to account for. But they're all nationalists. You know, they all believe that. America needs to be strong and they need to protect their borders. Um, some of them have kind of moved past it and they say we're not American nationalists because the American empire, the American state needs to go and we need to replace it with, with ethno states. So they've, they don't identify as American nationalists so much as nationalists. But this is, it becomes kind of nitpicky uh, after a while. Yes. Two questions. Sure, One both is, of them. How the hell did you stand it? Oh. And the second is, did you accomplish what you set out? I mean, did you learn something to give you better understanding of what happened in Norway? Um, okay, so I, I was able to stand it because I was very open with who I was and what I believed in. I've always, always voted socialist. And I told them that I'm a journalist, but that, that I want to come in and, and talk to you guys. And kind of being that honest and open with who I was and what I believed allowed me to fight back and argue, which became a safety valve. You know, if you spend three, four days, well, any amount of time with these people, you either have to argue and fight back or you're going to have to hit your head against the wall many, many times because it's deeply frustrating. I mean, some of the notions that they have are horrifying, some are confoundably ignorant, and some are just unfathomable. So I needed that safety valve to be able to say, listen, I, this is wrong. This is just wrong. Um, whether or not I learned something, I think, you know, if I can sort of tie it up in, an, in like an after school kind of lesson, I learned that, as I was telling you, that they come from all walks of life. That we sh I mean, a Nazi isn't someone who walks around with a swastika tattooed on his forehead. I've met plenty of those, but they come in all different shapes and sizes, and we need to realize that they're not, how do I say this? Um, I mean, they're us almost, like we're all, we're all part of the same human race, and we need to try to understand what fuels racism and where it comes from to protect ourselves and to make sure that as few as possible sort of crossover. I also learned that you can come back. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, one uh, a member of a group called the Hammerskins, which is a very, very nasty strain of skinheads, texted me and said that he's he's left the movement and that he wants to help bring other people out as well. And so I learned that we should, you know, in a way hate the crime and not the criminal. We should make clear exactly how unacceptable this kind of politics is and these ideas are abhorrent and awful. But if they want to come back to us, then they can, and then they should. So I think that's an important lesson that I, that I learned. And there's no, there's no quick fix to this. People say that it's about poverty, and it's about um, the increasing downward social mobility of this country. And yeah, sure, it would help if we had a social safety net. But Norway has an amazing social safety net, and we still have these people. So I think there is something in us. And I think at the moment, we're living in a time where there's a zeitgeist of selfishness and xenophobia, and I think our politicians are taking advantage. And, uh, you know, I also learned that this is a relatively small movement. The Klan in the 1920s walked down Pennsylvania Avenue. There was 40,000 of them. Um, they got a lot of politicians elected in the 20s. They caused incredible amount of suffering in the 1960s in, um, in, in the South. Um, but they're never going to be that again, I mean, or most likely, but that's not the point. The point is that the rhetoric that's born in the far right, the ideas that came from the far right, such as chain migration and all these things, were, this, is, this is coming from the White House now. This is coming from the halls of power. So, you know, we're not going to have a neo-Nazi president anytime soon, and the Klan isn't going to regain its power, but that kind of doesn't matter because they got their points through, and we're talking about them in civilized society. And that should terrify us all. So I think maybe maybe that's what I learned. And another thing, I'm sorry to keep going on this. Um, America, you know, the the white hegemony in America doesn't need the Klan or the neo Nazis to survive. This is white supremacy in America is alive and well on its own. Like we, this country has perfected. 
you know, a million ways, large and small, to, to maintain um, white superiority, you know, uh, uh, incarceration, policing, um, health care, um, housing. There's, there's all these ways, large and small, that, where, that people of color in this country and poor people are being kept down. So, you know, white supremacy is alive and well, and we don't need the Klan to sustain it. It's, it's doing just fine. A long answer, I'm sorry. Um, have you been in contact with any of these people since uh, Steve Bannon kind of fell from grace in the White House and he's no longer in the central circle? Yeah. I'm in contact. I mean, Matthew texted me today uh, to talk about, did you guys see yesterday Richard Spencer tried to do a speech at, um, at Michigan State University? So that's a positive, right? Yesterday, Richard Spencer, I'll, I'll get to this thing, but I just want to, that's it. Yesterday, Richard Spencer the god emperor of the alt-right gave a speech at Michigan State University at a room that used to be used for cattle auctions and there were maybe 15 people in the room. So that's good. Like we, we, we talk about these people a whole lot. We give them a lot of attention. Me, maybe more than anyone, but they're not that big a deal. We need to understand them to understand where this hateful rhetoric is coming from, but he gave a talk to 15 people and most of them didn't really give a shit. Um, Steve Bannon was Steve Bannon was more a function of the the lighter side of the alt right, the circle alt light. But he was a, he was a big deal. He was one of the very many ways that Trump signaled to the far right that he was kind of their guy or that he was willing to listen to them. Um, so that that was that was big for them when when he got elected. Um, They've had this sort of, they've been playing footsie with each other for a long time, the Trump campaign, the Trump presidency in the far right. Um, you know, no one takes a week to figure out whether or not David Duke is a bad guy or like, you know, as, as, as Donald Trump did. So there's been all this back and forth, but few people on the far right fully believe that Trump was their guy. He's a proof of concept, okay? Trump showed that nationalist ideas have traction that they can get into the White House, but they admit that Trump is a flawed candidate, that he's a, you know, that he's gonna turn into a mainstream Republican. But the fact is they don't care. One, because as I said, he's, he was the proof that things can work for them. And the other thing is, as long as he keeps promising to build the wall, they really don't care about anything else. Trump can do whatever the hell he wants. If he builds that wall, it'll be a roaring success in, in their mind. So yeah. Yes, sir. Is there a way to define national socialism as opposed to socialism in Norway? Like, like capitalism is basically one thing, isn't it? Yeah. Socialism. Um, I'm trying to go back to my poli sci bachelor here. Um, national socialism. Uh, I mean, we know how it played out. It became this sort of very ethnic, uh, ethnically cleansing form of national socialism. The socialism we have in Norway is called democratic socialism, which embraces the, the free market, but with a strong uh, social safety net. The national socialism of Germany, I don't really know it that well. I mean, I know they favored a very strong state, and this is, there were many weird moments reporting this book, and one of the weirder moments w was realizing that there was overlap between Matthew Heimbach's politics and my own, when we discovered that we both love trade unions and that were very in favor of, you know, strong labor laws um, and universal health care, which apparently Hitler was too, so I don't know. Um, but yeah, th I mean, there are, I guess there are overlaps between national socialism and, and socialism, but it, I, yeah, it turned into just an awful thing, or I guess it was always just an awful thing. I don't know enough about this poli uh, the, the poli-sci aspect of it. Can I answer any other questions? Yes. Okay. Um, can you comment on whether you think maybe Trump is a one-off? Because it seems like other candidates have tried to run Trump-like election or can campaigns and failed to be elected. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the other thing is, um, back when Trump was elected. Uh, people didn't know about all the Russian interference yeah. and how that affected his uh, sure. election. Okay, so on whether or not I think Trump is a one-off, I think no for two reasons. 
The first reason is because the whole Republican Party has seemed pretty happy to just follow him on whatever crazy scheme he's got going. So he's already dragged the party to the right, and all the primary challenges have been from the right, and so the incumbents have also had to move to the right. So it seems like we're seeing a, a pretty massive shift further right from the Republican Party, which doesn't bode well for whoever comes next. You know, we thought that um, Mitt Romney would be a good candidate because it was about time that the, the Republican Party went a bit more moderate, but I don't see them going that way. Cause well, what about like the, the gubernatorial election in Virginia where the Republican candidate tried to be very Trump-like and lost? I think that's, um, I think it comes down to a state-by-state -state basis. And you know, the way this electoral system is set up, I still think it's a pretty much a, a, a toss-up. and. In, in the states that are swing states, I don't necessarily think that moderation is is the way to go for Republicans. But, you know, this isn't really my field, but I, I, I you know, populism works. Uh, it, it, it's working in Europe right now, and it's, and it's working here. But the other reason as well is that people seem to think that, you know, it's the, the pendulum is swinging in America, and right now it's swinging to a far right sort of nationalistic point of view. But there's always been white supremacy in America. America has never been a moderate country when it comes to comes to race relations. It might have felt that way at certain points in our history where we sort of talked about it more openly, but it, the the pendulum has other never ever been, as far as I can tell, at least to the to the other side. There's always been it's always been firmly lodged at the almost the white supremacist um, end of the spectrum, which isn't to say that Americans are white supremacists, far, far from it, but it's just that the system right now is set up to, to, to work in this way. Um, I'm sorry, what was the other question? Uh, Russian interference. Russian interference. Um, they don't care for two reasons. The first reason is that they don't believe that it's true. Because if you look at the news or if you look at the polling, this country is split down the middle. And you know, 50% believe that Miller is on to something and that he's going to find something, and 50% believe literally that it's a, it's a witch hunt. So they don't, they're not sold on this thing. And even if it were true, the far right has a very, very big crush on Russia because Russia has become this beacon of far right um, identity, far right traditions in Europe. Putin has managed to sort of establish himself as the patron saint of, of, of a pan European. Um, cultural heritage. So Russia has become the shining city on a hill for far-right activists in Western Europe and in America. And, you know, America isn't the only election where they've meddled. They gave a lot of money to France. They've helped out far-right groups in Germany and, and Hungary. So a lot of far-right groups here in America are now turning to Russia. They have training camps in St. Petersburg where they go. They try to woo various Russian nationalists to get rubles because they believe that Russia can fund them. So even if it, even if they did believe that the Russians meddled, I think they would welcome it. Yeah. Did you mention that Heimbach was uh, Orthodox? He's a Russian Orthodox, yeah. Did he adopt that? Yes. So Heimbach, the reason I picked him is that Heimbach, when I met him, he was, he was, a, he was a budding far-right leader, right? But he would say things like, white supremacy has no place in the white nationalist movement. I don't think that the white race is better than any other race. It just happens to be my race. And he said all these things that were interesting from sort of an anthropological standpoint. I thought that's a new way to behave on the far right. And he wanted to gather the far right and he wanted to rid the far right movement of any notions of white supremacy. He wanted the, he wanted the swastika out of there and he wanted all racial slurs out of there and you know he kind of succeeded and kind of failed at the same time but he's been as long as I've known and he's been on a on a rightward trajectory and before I knew him he was a socialist at the University of Towson so he's a very good example that not all of these people are broke stupid and 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 racist he was he was very much a, a liberal at, at one point so it's been it's been a it's been a it's been a journey but he's a Russian Orthodox now because he feels that after the East-West schism, that the church became cowardly. He's very pro, um, he's very against gay marriage, and he's very against abortion. So he, he's looking for a strong church with strong values. 
which is reflected in the views that the far right, how the far right sees women, which is of course very old fashioned and patriarchal. Uh, yes, yes sir. You know, uh, we have a socialist um, city council member here, Shama Sawan, and um, one time she was giving a talk and she was talking about that she comes from India and they perfected this caste system 3,000 years ago. And she said that uh, rulers, you know, authoritarian rulers can't really rule, especially under capitalism, without a caste system. So that's one question. Maybe you want to talk about that, this whole racial thing that Americans seem to be so hung up on. You know, uh, how does that relate to the people at the top? You know, how, how the, you know, they kind of push those ideas in order yeah. to divide and rule. Well, I mean, there is a clear caste system in America. Well, maybe not clear, but I mean, it's always been in the interest of the elites in, in any country to kind of keep the poor separated and, and governable. Um, in the antebellum South, the, the populist party was a party of freed slaves and, and poor white people, and it became quite popular. And only after that became somewhat of a threat to the status quo did they institute the Jim Crow laws because they needed to, they, they saw that poor people of color and, and, and white people were getting together, which, which was a threat. I, I've spoken to Matthew about this a lot, and I've said that yes, there are no doubt very poor, economically disenfranchised white people that you support in Appalachia and in the Rust Belt, but you gotta realize that there are many, many millions of other poor people, predominantly of color, and if poor people in America got together, regardless of color, then maybe they might have something. But at the moment, they're very much separated, and I think that's in the interest of the of the status quo, without being too conspiratorial about it. Is that? Yeah. Hmm? Yeah. Uh, yes, you. So, um, so when David Nywart was here recently talking about recruiting by the alt-right of people in tech. So can you speak to that? Was that something you found, that it was like there's a recruitment effort among tech people? Or maybe um, that's just out here? Well, I think they recognize where the power is. And being a movement that this current incarnation, at least, is born online, I think they recognize that um, the value of tech, which is why we've seen, you know, the emergence of social media services like Gab, which is the free speech version of, of Twitter, you know, in the sense that it allows people to be wildly racist and offensive. Um, so I, I, think they, I think they recognize that. I think a lot of people got into this movement through tech. I mean, it allows people to be anonymous. It allows people to be racist and quote unquote active from the comfort of their own home. So I think they see that this is a huge, huge recruitment tool. Um, and as I said, they're not idiots, so they, they see where the, the, the potential is. Um, they'll recruit anywhere where they see potential. That's why you're seeing this big push at colleges across the country. Um, I, I don't, tech is my expertise, and the people I've mainly covered in this book are more the boots on the ground, um, but it doesn't surprise me at all, at all. Did you have a question? Oh, Recently, okay. Seattle had that gathering of just all right members in the yeah. man area, and they had their secret meeting of how they were going to undermine different coworkers of yeah. this type of diversity. Well, because I think I think that's a response to the challenges they met in 2017. Because I I had lunch with Richard Spencer right after the election, and he said that the difficulties now were that they had this movement that was mostly online, but that had implicitly at least, gotten a lot of responsibility for electing Trump, how do you take that movement and turn it into something actionable and something with some kind of clout? And we've seen them try throughout the year, most infamously in, in Charlottesville, which was a spectacular failure for them. One, because it, it fractured the movement into a million pieces, but also because it was the most successful physical gathering of far-right activists, but it was only 400 people which is a lot if you see them in a small town, but it's not enough to really shake the foundations of, of America. So I think a lot of them went back to the drawing board and said, okay, this is what we're good at. We're good at being rebellious and obnoxious and anarchistic online, so maybe this is, this is how, we should, how we should proceed. 
they're all they they have no one agenda or one way to do things so i think the smart you know the smart money would be on on mobilizing more online i think who's tend to run a family yes and no I would say, um, you know, the clan certainly runs in families. My pappy and my pappy's pappy was a, was a, was a, a clansman. But I mean, for one, that's not an excuse. There's no, you you should know better in in this day and age. Um, I think obviously the way we raise our kids matters uh, uh, a huge degree. But I, a lot of these guys, and they are predominantly guys, are young white males in their early twenties, and it's. Um, I think there's a lot of sort of a rebellion involved in it too. You saw after Charlottesville that a lot of kids, I, I call them kids, but a lot of them left the movement because suddenly it did become very, very real. Um, as I say, they come from they come from all over. Matthew Heimbach lost his entire family because they they hate what he's become and the, and the politics that he's chosen. Uh, Richard Spencer's family aren't too happy with him either. So. It, it varies, but certainly, you know, if you teach your kid to be an asshole, then he's probably going to be an asshole and teach his kids about it too, I guess. There's a lesson in there somewhere. Do you see these individuals having severe psychological problems and they use the canopy white supremacist to cover it? Not, uh, no, not as a whole, no. Um, I think, obviously, people like, um, like Dylan Roof, who, who shot up the church in South Carolina has, I, I believe you can't kill a bunch of people without something something being wrong with you. But I think we we paint with a broader brush like that at our peril. We need to understand that you don't need to be crazy or stupid to be a racist. We need to understand that this comes from somewhere. And if we're gonna try to defeat it, then we need to take it seriously and not just say that, oh, this is insanity or, or this is just stupid. So, no. I think the politics of white supremacy and bigotry are ugly and abhorrent, but I don't think it's crazy. I'm not saying crazy. I'm saying psychological problems. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. That was... Um, no, I don't think so. Some, of course, but no. I don't well, think narcissism is a, is a psychological problem, and that equates basically to white supremacy, or any type of supremacy. Sure. I, I mean, I'm not a. I'm not a. Double set of standards. I do, but you don't have. You have to, but I don't have to have follow the same rules. Yeah. I'm number one. I'm not a psychologist. I'm just. Uh, I'm just a guy. Uh, that's my experience of them. Some of them are clearly narcissistic, like Heimbach and Spencer. I think the leaders are absolutely some kind of egomaniacal diagnosis or of of some sort, but. I think for the most part, they're pissed off, scared, confused people. Look, there's so much wrong in the world. Like there's so many issues facing us, right? Everything from immigration from Syria in, in, in Europe to unemployment, to the opioid crisis, to uh, downward social mobility, as we spoke about. There's a lot of stuff going on and the reasons for them are many faceted and confusing and complex. and. If someone comes along and, and convincingly says, you know, you don't have this is all because of the Jews or this is all because of the the Mexicans, then to a certain person that becomes very tempting. Um, so I think it's mostly that. I mean, it's a confusing world, and when someone comes along and take advantage of that confusion, um, that becomes pretty that becomes a pretty potent mix. But I'm sure there are diagnoses out there too. Yes, sir. So. Continuing on this psychology thing, the more I study about human cognition, the more I realize that people aren't rational. <laughs> and uh, so we all know people like this, and lots of us have people like that in our families and everything. But, you know, we talk to them too. And one thing is, you know, facts really don't matter that I've discovered. Mm. And, you know, you spent a lot of time with these people. Uh, did you ever feel like you made any headway with any of these people, that they actually listened to you, or you actually got into some kind of a conversation that went somewhere? I, a few times, yeah. And, I mean, I feel good about um, the skinhead contacting me immediately as he chose to leave the movement. I felt like there must have been a reason maybe he contacted me about it. Um, I don't 
as you say, I don't think facts matter. I think people have to realize themselves that what their their beliefs are are wrong ha uh, wrong headed and um, uh, and awful. Um, I don't think we should stop arguing with them. I don't think we should stop protesting and making our opinions known. I I do think it doesn't help to punch them. I mean, the best moment, uh, the the most important moment in in the white nationalist movement in America in the last few years was when Richard Spencer got punched. I mean, that rallied the troops in a way that Trump or anyone else ever could. Um, but we should make it known that we find this politic, uh, th this this ideology disgusting and abhorrent, and we should protest it. But we shouldn't be surprised that it, it won't sway many, many of them either. It's gonna be a long haul, and you know, we defeat this by, I don't know, education and by compassion and by policy mo more than anything else you know give money to give money to schools uh, uh, work on work on housing desegregation there's there's a million things but you know just arguing with them won't necessarily do it as anyone who has an uncle or something at Thanksgiving will know you know um, I think a lot of it has to do with it at least with my relatives They've never been around any black people, or they've never been around anybody that's of a different race. One of the strongest areas of the KKK in the 60s was Indiana, which was a state that at the time was predominantly white. And I think the reason for that was that if you were in, in a state where there were many African Americans, then you knew that you had these people under control. They didn't present much of a threat because of Jim Crow, uh, Crow laws and, and, sun, and, um, and sundown laws there weren't that much of a threat. And I think the reason that why they were strong in country in, in states where there were mostly white people was because they heard rumors about these black people and thought they sounded awfully scary. So I think I think you're right. It's in predominantly white areas where this kind of racism flourishes oftentimes. We seem to be kind of at a moment. Uh, we don't see any more pitch panels in the streets like Charlottesville. Except yeah. yesterday. Who was that saying? I must in in uh, in Michigan, those were some pretty brutal fights. But yeah, you're right. You're right. Um, after Charlottesville, a lot of people realized that this just wouldn't do. I mean, these big rallies would just. I mean, because because some of them actually would like to give a speech. Some of the people at Charlottesville actually were there too, because they wanted to be heard, and they realized that you know the way things are now, it just these speeches will just will just end up, everyone will just end up fighting. So there's no good. But yesterday was a pretty big one. A uh, few people got sent to the hospital. A bunch of people went to the, um, got arrested. So it, it still happens. And these battles get more and more pitched. People bring more and more weapons. So there'll be more deaths very soon. I'm pretty sure of it. On that happy note, um, anything else I can answer or, yeah? Cool. Thank you very much, guys. I appreciate it. I had one thing I forgot earlier. Uh, there was a man who was interviewed on radio, and I don't remember his name, but he started a website, and he started an organization called Life After Hate. And he was Christian Picciolini. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So he has a lot of clout because he used to be one of the founding members of the first skinhead crew in America. So he knows these kids, and he knows where they're coming from, and he does very valuable work in, in bringing them back. But he... It's extremely slow. Like he maybe he's, he's I think he's done it for ten years, and you know maybe he's brought out a handful. So it's slow, 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 tough work. I mean, it's you, you do it one at one at a time, but it's it's hopeful they can come back to us. I like his uh, his idea of, of his uh, organization, Life After Hate. Yeah, it's a very good organization. They they do they do very important work. So what I fear is that our economic system is not sustainable. And I have lived through economic meltdowns. I covered in the 20 years I was a foreign correspondent to disintegrating societies. I know what the warning signs look like. Um, and once that stability is eradicated, and I don't know what's going to trigger it, whether it will be another financial collapse 
or as Alfred McCoy points out in the shadows of American century, the day the dollar is dropped as the world's reserve currency. You know, if you read the New York Times stories closely, because they say, but the dollar is the world's reserve currency. But I'm going to stay that way. McCoy said by 2030 it's finished. And at that moment, everything implodes. You can't maintain your empire, imports become expensive, chronic underemployment, unemployment. The elites have no plan B because they can't lower interest rates any more than they've lowered them. And at that point, you have created fertile ground for the kind of scapegoating, demonizing, and violence. And we already have a president who speaks in, incites violence rhetorically. You've created fertile ground for the rise of an American fascism. And our only response now is sustained mass acts of civil disobedience. That's it. And the state will be vicious. I was at Standing Rock. But Standing Rock's the model. It's got to have a spiritual dimension in the way Standing Rock had one. It's got to understand that what we're fighting for is the systems of life, is the sacred, is the understanding that there are people and things around us that have an intrinsic value beyond a monetary value. And when we are effective, when we are effective, as we saw with Standing Rock, they will throw everything at us. Remember, Standing Rock was under Obama. 700 arrests, a nonviolent protest, attack dogs unleashed on the crowds, water cannons laced with pepper spray, unleashed, fired, or hosing down the protesters in sub-zero temperatures. Constant infiltration, constant drones. When I drove in in November, I, I had to come all the way around because the roads were blocked. But when I was stopped, these weren't law enforcement. They were dapple mercenaries in Kevlar vests with long barrel weapons with no identification. We have no time left. Just from climate change. We have no time left. And in that sense, resistance becomes a moral imperative. We have to stop being constrained by the tyranny of the practical. We have to understand, as Daniel Berrigan once told me, I asked him, how do you define faith? And he said, the belief that the good draws to it the good even if empirically everything around you says otherwise. I have kids. We may fail, but at least I want my kids to say he tried. I'm not going to be complicit. I'm not going to be passive. And I can tell you that the good does draw to it the good those ironic points of light that flash out wherever the just exchange their messages. May I compose like them of eros and of dust, beleaguered by the same negation and despair, show an affirming flame. I covered the revolutions in Eastern Europe. And the revolution is what I'm calling for. And I'll spell that for the homeland security. <laughs> I'm not playing the games anymore. We don't have time. I'm calling for the overthrow of the corporate state. And we will overthrow it just as the regimes in Eastern Europe were overthrown, through nonviolence and through essentially carrying out sustained acts of mass civil disobedience, acts of conscience, because no revolution succeeds as the writers of revolutionary theory, Crane, Britton, Davies, and others have noted, unless a certain segment of the ruling apparatus defects. Then they're finished. So it's 1989, I was there. Honecker, the communist dictator in East Germany, sends down an elite paratroop division to Leipzig. 
to crush the demonstrations. They get there. The local communist authorities refuse to deploy them. Honaker's out of power in a week. Same thing with the Russian Revolution. They send the Cossacks in to crush the rioters in Petrograd. They refuse. The Tsar is gone. He doesn't even make it back. He has to abdicate on a, in a railway carriage. That's how it works. The good draws to it the good. And nobody knows how rotten, corrupt, and decayed this system is better than the people who manage it. I was in Prague. It was every evening in the Magic Lantern Theater with Václav Havel during the Velvet Revolution. You had posters all throughout the city of Jan Pollock, a Charles University student who, to protest the Soviet invasion in 1968, went to Wenceslas Square, lit himself on fire. Four days later, he died of his burns. His funeral, which was not reported by state media, was broken up by police. When his grave became a shrine, his body was exhumed, his, his remains were cremated, and his mother was not allowed to rebury them. A week after the communist government fell, 10,000 Czechs marched to Red Army Square and renamed it Jan Pollock Square. I was in Wenzelau Square with half a million Czechs. In December of 89, it was snowing. So the great Czech singer Marta Kubasheva comes out on the balcony. Now she had sung in 1968 a prayer for Marta to protest the Soviet invasion, the overthrow of Dubček, and the installation of a pro-Soviet regime. Once the Soviets took power, they destroyed her recording stock. She was banned from the airwaves. And in the intervening years, she worked on an assembly line in a toy factory. And when she walked out on that balcony and began to sing a prayer for Marta, every check in the crowd knew every word. That is the good drawing to it, the good. But if we don't stand up, it can't be seen, and we can't use the word hope. I don't know if we will win. I don't even know if we will survive as a species. But these corporate forces have us by the throat, and they have my children by the throat. And in the end, I don't fight fascists because I will win. I fight fascists because they are fascists. Thank you.